Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, June the 30th, 2023. It is currently 1126 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. I almost stopped myself from saying where I'm coming to you live from. I was going to say, I'm coming to you live from an undisclosed location six miles below the surface of the earth. Can you go six miles below? I I was going to say I'm I'm in hiding. I'm in a bunker somewhere. I, I'm I'm no longer even in the United States of America. In fact, I'm I'm broadcasting from outer space. I was going to say something like that, but I went ahead and said theology central st- studio. I almost stopped myself right in the middle of that. But yes, the theology central studio located right here in Abilene. Texas. Now, the reason I don't necessarily want to tell you where I'm broadcasting from, the reason I don't necessarily want to give you my email address, is because this episode is going to be one of those that's going to upset a lot of people. A lot of people are going to get ticked off, and it's going to be reflected in in my email, it's going to be reflected on in the YouTube comments section. It's going to be reflected on other podcast apps where people can post comments. It's going to be reflected in probably we getting very negative ratings on the Apple uh, on the Apple podcast app. Uh, we're probably going to get lots of thumbs down on Pandora. When people are going to voice their displeasure, and that's okay. That's perfectly okay. Uh, I do give my email address because I try not to hide behind the microphone. Uh, but I, I at the same time, I don't necessarily want that. So here's what I'm going to ask of everyone. Please, 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 please try to set aside your strong emotions and listen carefully, thoughtfully, and understand that I'm trying to approach this subject philologically. Not, I don't, I'm not picking a side. I'm like, well, my team is different than your team. And you're, I, I'm trying to look at this from a theological, biblical perspective. And I, I hope that you will at least try to hear that out and understand it. You, you still may disagree with me. That's fine because Christians never agree on anything, but hopefully you'll understand that I, there's no sinister conspiracy involved here that I'm just trying to approach this subject in the most biblical, theological, rational way that I can, because I believe sometimes when the subject we're going to be talking about is discussed, emotions get in the way, feelings get in the way. And in many cases, I believe people take such a strong stand because they truly believe they're taking a biblical stand. They really believe they're taking a stand for righteousness, for holiness, for godliness, but inevitable without even realizing it, They literally undermine and destroy the very gospel that we are to hold dear. It's the truth of the gospel. It's the truth of justification. Justification is the doctrine the church stands or falls on, right? Or do you disagree with that? It's just, I believe some subjects get spoken of and it's like, oh no, I'm going to take a stand for holiness and righteousness and godliness and I'm going to condemn it. But inevitably, sometimes what you don't realize you're doing is you undermine the very gospel. You undermine the very doctrine of justification, So you may want to take a stand for so-called righteousness, holiness. You may want to take a stand in order to fight the culture war. I'm going to take a stand to try to support and hold to a biblical understanding of justification. And if we don't understand each other, then if, if, if you don't understand that perspective that I'm coming to you from, then you're going to greatly misinterpret what I'm about to say. All right. Does, I hope that makes sense. You're going to be like, no, I'm taking a stand against sin. And I understand that and I appreciate that. But while you take your stand against sin, I'm going to say, I'm going to take my stand to to clearly teach and stand and defend what I believe is the biblical doctrine of justification. All right. Now, with all of that out of the way, 
what we're really going to be talking about today, before we get to the to the topic in a very specific way, but in a more general way, really what the main focus is, as I really want you to ask this question, what saves a person? How does a person truly become saved? What saves a person? When, when we talk about a person being saved, a person experiencing salvation, what saves them? What they do or don't do or what Christ did. Are we truly justified by grace alone through faith alone because of Christ alone? Or are we justified by, well, we do this or do this and do this. Now, typically what Christians will say, no, 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 we're not saved by doing those things. But if we save, we will do those things. But then you turn around and say, if you don't do those things, or if you do those things, then you are never saved. Meaning I have to do those things in order to be saved. And you create kind of a workspace system. I've, I've watched this take place over and over. It's been going on for a couple of years, but you will hear things like this. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democratic. If you vote for Democrats, you cannot be a Christian. Well, when did salvation become determined by who or who I don't, who I vote or don't vote for? How can you say that my salvation has anything to do with who I vote for? Now, you could say, well, I believe your salvation should impact who you vote for. Fine. But you can't turn around and say they vote for a Democrat. They can't be saved. Where, where, where in the Bible is salvation determined by who you vote for? Now, you can. I got no problem saying, well, wait a minute. If you take the truths of Scripture, I think it should lead this direction. That's OK. But you can't say those who vote Democratic are not saved. That, that, that's turning, a, that's a whole different, you're, you're attacking the doctrine of justification. Some will say you cannot support abortion and be saved. Well, once again, are we saved by our faith in Jesus Christ or are we saved by what we believe about cultural issues or political issues? Because it's almost like, hey, this is how you, how do, how do I become saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, what you must do to be saved is number one, never vote for a Democrat. Number two, do not support abortion. Number three, don't do this. Number four, support. And we have all of these things. Now, what we will say is, no, 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 no. We're not saying you have to do that to be saved. But we're saying if you don't do that, or if you do do that, then you were never saved. But it's the same thing. You're just, you're just talking in circles. What must you do to be saved? I believe salvation is by faith alone, trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, I hope that once I become saved and I begin studying and reading the Bible, it will have a profound impact on how I think and what I do. But I know I don't care who you are as a Christian. You may, you may have the, you may be voting right. You may not support the wrong things, but guess what? There's still plenty of sin in your life. So why is it voting Democrat would be the thing that would, would prove that you're not saved and not all of the other things in your life that should prove that you're not saved? Because God's law demands perfection internally and externally. I mean, I like if you're going to point that out as proof of, of not being saved, I can point out 50 other things that should prove that you're not saved. Be holy as God is holy. Are you holy as God is holy? No, you're not. Not practically. Therefore, then I guess you're not saved. Oh, no, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we have to be perfect. God's law demands perfection. What must a person do to be saved? So I've, I have seen, you can't vote Democrat. I've seen uh, you cannot uh, support abortion. And of course, a big one is that you cannot in any way, shape, or form, be a homosexual. You cannot have uh, homosexual desires. You cannot have uh, th that, that your entire you know, sexual preference of someone of the same sex. You cannot do that. Obviously, you cannot engage in same-sex relationships because if you are, you cannot be saved. Okay, um, all right, someone just said they're having these conversations with uh, their pastor. I think a lot of people are having these conversations because you hear this kind of stuff preached from the pulpit all the time. Now, I don't know which way their pastor is going, but I hear this kind of stuff all the time. 
You can't do this and be saved. You can't do this and be saved. And it's always weird. Hey, you're like you're 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 looking at a congregation. You got some uh, say teenagers in the back. Two of the teenagers, homosexual desires, struggling with homosexual relationship. You can't be saved. On the other side of the church, uh, two teenagers, one's male, one female, but they are struggling with premarital sex and with lust. Wait a minute. So the heterosexuals who are struggling with premarital sex and and lust, they're saved. But the two struggling with ho- uh, homosexual desires, they can't be saved. Like who who gets to just make these random decisions on what salvation is or isn't? Um. Yeah, someone says I want to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ, not my own works. Absolutely. Now, the reason I'm speaking about this and trying to just get you to think, and I'm, I'm kind of just throwing a lot of things out right now just to try to get you to think is because right now on the Sermons 2.0 app, the featured sermon of the day is, do gay Christians exist? I have no idea what their answer is. I have no idea. I've not listened to the sermon. But what I want to do is I'm going to use the sermon mainly to just have this broader con- con- conversation about how is a person saying, I feel like the church is losing that answer. How is a person saved? We always say, well, to believe in Jesus, but then we turn around and go, but, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay. I know you believed in Jesus. I know you're trusting in him alone for salvation. I know you're acknowledging yourself as a sinner and you're trusting in his imputed righteousness. Congratulations. But wait, however, okay, we've got to talk. Now, if you do this, you're not, if you, if you vote for Democrats, you can't be saved. If you support abortion, you can't be saved. If you're struggling with homosexuality, you can't be saved. If you do this, you can't be saved. If you go to a drag show, you can't be saved. If you and just go on and on and on, you just, you know, if you watch Disney, you can't be saved. Who knows? You know, if you don't vote for Trump, you can't be saved. Just, we start adding all of these additional things to determine who is saved and who is not saved. And none of those things are here in scripture. Now, some people will try to find some tests in scripture and say, well, it applies here, but sooner or later, your salvation becomes a works-based system. And, and, and one of the reasons I'm so sensitive to this is because many of you know, I got tired of hearing non-Catholic pastors bash Catholicism because I felt many cases they weren't being honest or truthful. So I decided to enroll in a Catholic university to pursue a degree in theology from a Catholic university just to add to my other degrees in theological studies. And it was there where I was kind of confronted. Hey, you know, you guys bash Catholicism as being a works-based system. You guys are just as works-based as we are. You just try to play a little game of semantics. Hey, you don't have to do this in order to be saved, but if you don't do this, then you were never saved, meaning you have to do it in order to be saved. (laughs) You just make it, it's just as much works-based. And I was like... Well, there's a little bit of truth to that. So started me, you know, really, really trying to understand justification from a non-Catholic perspective, right? Catholicism, justification is based off an infused righteousness, non you know, out from the Reformation, the more Protestant view is that we are saved by an imputed righteousness. It's, it's a clear distinction between infused and imputed. Well, imputed means God, I put my faith in Christ and then all of his righteousness, all of his in- obedience is imputed to me. So I am saved not by anything I do, don't do. I'm not saved by any of that. That has no bearing on my salvation because my salvation is based off an imputed righteousness that I obtain by faith, not by works. And it's imputed, meaning it's just I'm declared to be something that I am not. I'm declared to be something that I will never be in this life. I'm declared to be holy, perfect, obedient, and all of that. By faith alone, that is justification. And so that we come along and say, but if you don't do this and do this, you never justify. Well, wait a minute. You're trying to now judge me having imputed righteousness accredited to my account based on what I do and don't do. You can't judge imputed righteousness by practical actions. You cannot do that. That destroys the very definition of imputed righteousness. It's imputed. And not only that, just think about it. What we say is when you believe in Jesus, all your sins have been washed away by his blood. All of your sins have been paid for. Well, then you can't come on and go, but if you do this and do this, that's sinful. Therefore, you are not saved. All of those sins were paid for. 
So how can you use sins that have been paid for and covered in the blood to prove that somehow I'm not saved? And then how can you take my practical failures and then use that to then say, I don't have imputed righteousness. It literally destroys the doctrine of justification. So we're going to use this sermon in a minute to just, get, well, I'm just going to let him go whichever direction he goes. I'm not here to criticize. I'm not here to really even analyze. I'm here to just say, here's his perspective. And I'm guessing, I'm a, I think I'm about 99% certain he's going to go in a way different direction than I am. That gives you, the listener, the chance to hear two different perspectives. But I'm going to use it mainly to go, wait a minute, does that impact the doctrine of justification? I'm looking, I'm not here to criticize them. I just want to you. I'm like, hey, this is awesome. And not only that, I want to hear the perspective because it may challenge me. Remember, whenever I do a sermon review, I don't listen to it first. So I've seen the sermon. I hit play to make sure it was loud enough and that's it. And we're going to, I don't know which direction it's going to go, but it should be fun. It should be interesting. It should be beneficial for everyone involved. And I, I'm more than willing to change my perspective. I'm more than willing. But I believe before we can do anything, and I know I've raised lots of questions, and, 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 but I, that, I'm just trying to get you to think. I want you to see that these issues, everyone wants to talk about the homosexual issue or the, you know, vote Democrat issue or whatever the, the cultural issue is. To me, it's never that issue. My issue is they're like, oh, so you support homosexuality? Are you saying homosexuality is okay? No, what I'm saying is salvation is based on faith in Jesus Christ, not my, my sexual attraction or sexual preference. And I know this, that if you condemn homosexuals for their struggle with homosexuality, then you got to condemn all the heterosexuals for all the lust and pornography and adultery and uh, uh, fornication and on and on and on and on and on and on. But why do, so you got, again, you've got two kids in the, in the youth group, two teenagers, they're involved in all kinds, porn, lust, who knows what they're doing, but they're saved because they're heterosexual. But over here, Hey, those two are homosexuals. Well, you know they can't be saved. According to whom? Because we have this idea that the minute you become a Christian, if you're struggling with homosexuality, it just magically goes away. Boom. It just disappears. All of a sudden, you're heterosexual. Dun, dun, da, da. You go from homosexual desires to, now I'm a heterosexual. It, it doesn't work that way because if it works that way, then guess what? All heterosexuals should no longer have a problem with lust. All heterosexuals should no longer ever struggle with any sin. It should just magically go away. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm saying homosexuality is not a sin. That doesn't mean that I'm not saying fornication is not a sin or pornography is not a sin. I'm saying all of it is sin. But as Christians... Those of us who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, we all sin <laughs> continually in some way, shape, or form. That doesn't excuse it. That just means, hey, someone struggling with it, someone who has that desire, it doesn't mean they're not a saved. It just means that they're going to have to struggle with a different kind of sin than I have to struggle with. They're going to have their ups and downs, victories and failures, just like I have my ups and downs, victories and failures. So before we start the sermon, I'm looking at chapter 11 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Paragraph one in chapter 11 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith, which the chapter is entitled Justification. Paragraph one begins this way. Here we go. Those... God effectually calls, he also freely justifies. God is the one doing the justification, not us. He does this not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and accounting and accept, accepting them as righteous. Now, I want you to hear this. God is the one doing this, not us. It's not something I do or don't do. He does this not by, he doesn't infuse righteousness into me, he, but he pardons my sins and accounts and accepts me as righteous. Not by, he doesn't infuse any righteousness into me. It, he accounts me righteous. He, he accepts me as righteous. He does this for Christ's sake alone. 
The only reason this happens is because of Christ. Christ is holy. Christ is perfect. Christ is righteousness. And Christ is righteous. Now that is imputed or accredited to me. I'm accepted as Christ because of faith. Hang on, now listen. He does this for Christ's sake alone, not for anything produced in them or done by them. This, this has nothing to do with what is produced in me or done by me because imputed righteousness doesn't do anything in me. It's imputed. That's the whole point. It's imputed. It does nothing in me. It just declares me to be something I am not. It takes a rebel, a sinner, and declares them to be perfect and holy, even though they are not. And we know in practice that we are not. He does not impute faith itself, the act of believing, or any other gospel obedience to them as righteousness. Instead, he imputes Christ's active obedience to the whole law and passive obedience in his death as their whole and only righteousness by faith. This faith is not self-generated. It is the gift of God. That's chapter 11 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith, paragraph one. That is what I am going to defend. That is what I'm going to take, take my stand on. You may want to argue and fight. No, we got to take a stand against this and we got to fight this and we got to stand for righteousness and holiness. Stand for righteousness, stand for holiness, fight for that. But if in so doing, you destroy the doctrine of justification and you start throwing people out of the body of Christ because they do this or don't do this or don't do this or vote this way or do this or do that or do that. You're destroying a salvation that is by grace alone through faith alone because of Christ alone. You can't say you're not saved if you vote for a Democrat. You're not saved if you support abortion. You're not saved if you, you can't do that. Right, someone just said, I love that. I'm declared something I am not. Justified, right? Righteous. Okay, uh, some, someone said they're going to read uh, that chapter. Yes, everyone should read the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And th this, this, this is, to me, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, this chapter had a profound impact on me. And it started changing my view on a lot of things because I used to be very much one of those people like, no, okay, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone. Oh, I would say that. And then immediately say, however, if you're really saved, you'll do this, 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 you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And then I started realizing I was saying I was the things I wanted to say people aren't saved for doing were the things I weren't doing and the things I was doing, then I would have some kind of excuse for. But immediately I start, I'm undermining the doctrine of justification. Now, some people try to find a way to make these two work. Hey, I know I believe in justification by an imputed righteousness, but I'm going to demand that you do this and do this and don't do this and do this. And if you don't do that, you were never saved. Well, you're again judging imputed righteousness based off what people do or don't do. You can't judge imputed righteousness that way. Now, somebody saying, so you're saying Christians shouldn't be different? I'm not saying that. Christians should be. Christians should pursue holiness. Christians should pursue righteousness. We should. But we have to acknowledge that we still have a sinful nature and we fall short in thought, word, and deed by what we do and leave undone, not just every once in a while, all the time. So if I'm going to start trying to throw other people out of Christianity because of their sexual preference, because of their sexual desires, or because who they vote for, or because of what cultural issue they support, then I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to, before I start throwing them out of the kingdom of God, I'm going to look at myself and go, well, based off my, what I do here, desire here, I'm going to throw myself out of the kingdom of God. But the good thing is, it is God who justifies, not man. Who can lay, who can, who can accuse the elect of anything? It is God who justifies. I'm not justified by what I do or don't do. I am justified by imputed righteousness. Now, if you want to return to Rome, believe in a justification by infused righteousness, and then you must do this and do this and this sin. And then, you know, you, you no longer in a state of grace. And now you have to, you know, there's venial mortal. Sin. If you want to go that entire system, be my guest, go back to Rome, but I'm not going back to Rome.
And if I go back to Rome, then I'm not going to play. I mean, why? To me, many Protestant churches, I, I sometimes joke, they're more Catholic than Catholic. They seem to hold to a, a, a salvation that's much more infused righteousness based, much more works based than some Catholics. Why would I then go with a, a, a Protestant version of Catholicism? I'll just go back to the real thing. All right, now we spent 25 minutes just setting this up. But I want you to see, that's the issue here. The issue is not really the sermon. The sermon is, I just want to have something kind of as a a sounding board to hear a different perspective, possibly. To hear a different perspective. So, again, the sermon is called, Do Gay Christians Exist? Question mark. I'm assuming they are going to answer in a very resounding no Gay Christians do not exist. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe I'm wrong. But ultimately, I don't care how they answer it. They're just here to put forth a perspective so that we, that I can continue to restate over and over and over justification by imputed, not infused righteousness, justification by grace alone through faith alone, a justification where I'm declared to be something that I am not and that I never will be until glorification. That's what I'm going to try to defend. I have no idea where this is going to go, but again, the sermon is located on the Sermons 2.0 app or the Sermon Audio website. Look for Featured Sermon of the Day. Do Gay Christians Exist? You should listen to it. I would strongly recommend you listen to it. Hear their perspective. I'm not even here to necessarily fight with their perspective. I just want to use whatever perspective they provide as an opportunity for then us to have this deeper conversation. Like some people want to argue homosexuality. I want to argue justification, right? That's what I want to protect. All right, let's see where this goes. If you have a Bible with you this morning, turn with me to Romans 1. And we shall start with the 16th verse. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because of that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men working with men that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. 
being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Amen. And that is the word of God. Within the United States Code, Title 10 uniquely lays out for us the role of our armed forces. It provides for us the... What? Okay, all right. He just read Romans, and now we're talking about a code outlining the role of our armed forces? I'm getting really nervous really quick, okay? That was the strangest, weirdest transition. Hey, we just read Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to basically 32, and now we're going to talk about the role of the United States military. I just <laughs> wasn't expecting that. I will just point out, well, you know, I'm not even going to point anything out from the text. Just know that you, uh, I've worked through Romans chapter one, verse by verse. We were working on the book of Romans. We made it to chapter 10. Then we took a detour on law and gospel. And then that kind of got disrupted. So we need to get back to law and gospel, then get back to Romans. But you can listen to everything I preached on Romans chapter one and this famous, famous section where there's always so much controversy. And for some weird reason, I'm not saying he's going to do this, but Sermon after sermon after sermon, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 32, becomes all about homosexuality, even though we seem to sometimes forget. Fornication is mentioned. Wickedness is mentioned. Covetousness is mentioned. Maliciousness is mentioned. Envy is mentioned. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, uh, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, um, uh, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. All of that is listed as well. But they, they, what gets the attention is homosexuality, homosexuality, homosexuality. And when we uh, typically what happens is was it says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Please note who commits such things, all of those things. Who is worthy of death? Sin makes us worthy of death. All sin makes us worthy of death. All sin. The wages of sin is death. Right? Sin. What do we always say? Why is there death? Because of sin. We're all worthy of death because we're all sinners. Right? That's a very important principle because when you go to the Old Testament and God tells Israel to go in and kill every man, woman, boy, girl, and child, from a human perspective, it's horrific, it's horrible, and I nev never can understand it. From a theological perspective, all I can do is, well, God can have people wiped out because they all deserve death because they're all sinners. They're guilty in Adam and they're all sinners because of a sinful nature. Remember, we're sinners, not because we sin. We sin because we are sinners by nature, by our very being. That, that, that's, we're all, every one of us is worthy of death. I always find sermons that sometimes go to this passage where they start yelling and screaming that homosexuals are worthy of death. Well, we all deserve death. Now, I'm not saying he's going there, but I just have to point some of those things out. I just don't know why this just turned into a discussion about the United States military, but I'm assuming he's using the United States military as some kind of illustration, I'm assuming. Let's see where this goes. The legal basis for the roles, organization, and missions of each of the military services, as well as the United States Department of Defense. All of you seated here today in worship might be surprised to know that Section 8221 of Title 10 in the United States Code has the following explicit expectation. Quote, the commanders of vessels and naval activ activities to which chaplains are attached 
shall cause divine service to be performed on Sunday whenever the weather and other circumstances allow it to be done. And it is earnestly recommended to all officers, seamen, and others in the naval service diligently to attend at every performance of the worship of Almighty God. End quote. That's amazing, isn't it? Now, granted, that specifically is for the Navy, but it still amazes me that the worship of Almighty God is actually prescribed into United States code. And furthermore, the code goes on to protect chaplains to preach freely according to the tenets of their faith with the following statute. Quote, An officer in the chaplain corps may conduct public worship according to the manner and forms of the church of which he is a member. End quote. Now, as an officer in the Army's chaplain corps, why is that relevant to me? It's relevant because my passage this morning is Romans 1. If you know anything about the Bible, then you will know that Romans 1 clearly declares homosexuality to be sin. Okay. All right. Now I see what he's doing. Okay. So uh, because I guess he's a chaplain in the, in the United States Army, then he's reading these codes to say, hey, therefore, I'm, I can preach whatever is true to the tenets of my faith, no matter how controversial it is. And we all know Romans 1 condemns homosexuality. Now, I would just say we all know that Romans chapter 1 condemns sin, including homosexuality. Romans 1 include, it condemns, in fact, Romans 1, if you can kind of go Romans 1, 2, and 3, condemns all of us. It condemns all sin. It condemns us all as being sinners, including the act of homosexuality as being condemned as well. Right? I mean, I just think you, you, you have to be fair. Romans is not just about homosexuality. Romans demonstrates that everyone, no one seeketh after God. There is no one good. There is no one righteous. That means heterosexual, homosexual. It means anyone transgender tra who is transition, not transition. It doesn't matter your pronouns. It doesn't matter what your clothes you're wearing. It doesn't matter anything. We are all in the same boat. We are all sinners. Your, your sexual, your sexuality, your sexual preference, your gender identity. It is irrelevant. We're all in the same boat. Guilty before our holy God. And the solution to that problem isn't to use different pronouns. It isn't to uh, change your sexual preference. The solution is I'm a sinner. God is holy. And his solution was his son, Jesus Christ, who came, died to pay for all of my sins. And by placing my faith in him, his perfection is imputed to me. And I'm now to declare to be something that I will not be, cannot be, will never be until glorification. The solution is that. Now, I don't know where, where he's going to go. But I just want to make sure we understand Romans is not just a book about homosexuality. It, it, it's a book about man is sinful. And how is a sinful man, a sinful woman, a sinful anyone? How are they made right before a holy God? And the way we are made right is not according to our works, but according to faith alone. That declaration in today's America stirs up great animosity. In some American circles today, Romans 1 is even wrongfully categorized as hate speech. And while it would have been very easy to simply preach another passage this morning, what sort of minister would I be if I unfaithfully held back from teaching the entirety of God's counsel, especially such an important chapter from God's word, when even federal law protects and expects me to faithfully preach the entire word of God. So here we go. Last Sunday, while I was driving by 2nd Avenue North, not too far from the City University of Seattle, 
I saw a large edifice for the first United Methodist Church. And flying outside the church were two flags. One was the plain flag with one word, justice, on it. While the other was the colorful flag of the homosexual movement. And while such sights are sadly no longer shocking, it did grieve my heart to the point that I did ask myself, how in the world did we end up here? How is it that a church is now flying the gay flag? Now, I'm going to have a different, I don't know what, how he's going to answer this question. I'm going to answer the question probably in a different way. My perspective, when I see a United Methodist Church or any very liberal, liberal denomination, right? Very liberal denomination. They end up flying the justice flag and the pride flag or any other flag. They, they end up doing that. And listen, I, not because of culture, but because those denominations and those churches abandoned historical biblical Christianity years ago, years ago, they walked away. They started questioning the inspiration of scripture. They started questioning the infallibility of scripture. They started questioning things like the deity of Christ and, and salvation by the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And they started questioning the, the virgin birth and the incarnation. And they started questioning this and they started quite, well, I don't know if the, if the miracles are probably not real, they're myths. And, 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 and maybe the creation account is actually just an ancient Hebrew myth of creation and they begin to call into question so much. They basically threw out historical biblical Christianity. Well, once you throw out historical biblical Christianity, then it becomes a free for all. I believe those liberal, that's why whenever I, whenever I criticize the church, I rarely criticize the liberal, you can call it woke progressive church, because I believe those stopped being churches 30 years ago. They were walking away from historical biblical Christianity 30 years ago. They don't have any biblical Christianity left. So like they, 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 they're, they're already gone in my estimation, right? Like why people even stayed in those denominations don't make any sense to me in the first place. The denomination was gone. I remember my Lutheran pastor, um, way back. This is in the eighties. My, well, first of all, I went to an evangelical Lutheran church of America. It was the first Lutheran church I went that was so whacked and liberal. And it was, it was a total train wreck. Like, I don't even know what it was. Then I went to Missouri Synod, much more conservative, much more theological. Okay. And, and I'm very grateful for the, for the time there. But even that my pastor there was warning me of Lutheran seminaries and how liberal and how they deny this and deny this and deny this. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? Then why stay a part of it? That was my that was my view. But so I believe it was the moving away from biblical Christianity. And then guess what? If you don't have biblical Christianity, well, then you're not going to be worrying about theology and exposition of scripture. No, you're gonna you're gonna have to replace all of that with something else. Well, what do you replace it with? Well, social issues, a, a form of humanism about being good people and 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 we're going to engage we're going to try to fix the world through our our efforts it's not going to be so much a salvation gospel exposition of scripture theological it's going to be much more a social club a social group that cares about social issues but tries to do so and still trying to maintain well Jesus said love your neighbor they're going to still maintain some of the ethics found within Christianity but they've already undermined and thrown out the theology behind it now, I don't know what he's going to say how we got there, but that's how I feel they got there. He may have a different approach and I'm, I would love, I'm, 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 I can't wait to hear where he's going to go. And, uh, and to, just to say this though, let me say this. I was in the United States military for 20 or well, 19 years active duty. Then I've got medically retired because of everything that happened. I'm not going to go through that. And then, and then I, I kept working in basically the same job for what, a couple more years. So basically 22 years total. And I, I attended many cases, military chaplains, uh, military chapels. Um, I did so obviously in basic training. I did so in Germany. Uh, I knew many of the uh, military chaplains and I, I, I will say this. Hey, that's awesome that a military chaplain is will, willing to stand up and preach the word of God and not skip a passage and not worried about who he may or may not offend. So I got nothing 
but respect for that because military chaplaincy, yeah, there's there, I, there's clearly some pressure about what you preach and don't preach, and you, you got to be kind of quote unquote ecumenical and try to get along. Like there's there's a lot of issues of the military chaplaincy that I would have major problems with. I would have major issues with and find myself. I don't think I could do a lot of what they do um, be, uh, because a lot of times people ask me, well, why don't you become a chaplain? Why don't you become a chaplain? And I'm like, I don't know if I could exist in that world. Um, I, I don't think I could. But uh, I, but I d- I've definitely met at least one very godly, biblically minded chaplain. Uh, but most of the cases, they were just like, what in the world are they even like, what is even happening here? So that's awesome that he's there and he's willing to preach the word of God. Now, again, I would just want to make sure that when we look at Romans, that we don't we don't turn it into the homosexual chapter. Right. We don't we, we don't just we we we. No, Romans 1, 2, and 3 is making sure we all, we are all sinners. And then the hope is in what, well, God does through Christ Jesus. But we'll see where he's going to go. Let's see. He offer, let's listen to his explanation on how we end up with a church with a a pride flag in front of it. Well, I'm assuming it's it's the United Methodist Church. Again, just go look at the downfall of the United Methodist denomination years ago. This has been a long, this has been coming a long time ago. All right, here we go. Our flags have great significance. Everyone knows that. Just look at the flags of our fathers. Look at Iwo Jima. Symbolically and literally, that church in Seattle has been conquered. According to USA Today, the United Methodist Church is the largest mainline Protestant denomination with over 6.2 million members in the United States. For those of you unaware, earlier this year, in May, May 1st, the United Methodist Church decided to split over one vital issue, the issue of homosexuality. Those in favor of permitting homosexual affections, acts, and marriages stayed in the UMC while holding, while those holding to Romans 1 decided that the sin requires them to leave. And they subsequently formed the brand new Global Methodist Church. Now, my own personal opinion, my own personal opinion, if you study kind of the unraveling of the United Methodist Church, because anytime I've, uh, way before the homosexual issue ever became an issue, all United Methodist Churches I knew or listened to or paid attention over and over there, like they were a theological train wreck. So I, why, why would you split over the homosexual issue? You should have split over the theological issues, the undermining of scripture, the undermining of doctrine, the undermining of theology, turning into a social club, a million issues. So to me, the fact that they're splitting over homosexuality to me is foolish because they should have been splitting way over the theological issues. You never get to the homosexual issue if they say, if the people stand up and say, this is the inerrant inspired word of God and we're going to preach it and teach it. We're going to teach every verse. We're going to preach it. We're going to teach it with or without offense. We're going to understand it. We're going to apply it. We're going to put it in a historical context. It's textual context. It's literal context. We're going to, okay, well then you can avoid those issues. Issues. But we wait till we get to the homosexual issue and they're like, nope, nope, now we're a bridge too far. The bridge too far was the abandonment of historical biblical Christianity in my mind way before you ever get there. But hey, that's that's just that's just my thoughts. Just my thoughts. But okay, here we go. Folks, this is going on all around you. One of the bishops who decided to leave the UMC in his resignation letter wrote the following excerpt, quote, All of us, myself most definitely included, must confess to our complicity to a current cultural captivity and repent of our sin, both individually and corporately. The time for theological toleration saturated with moral indifference is long past. The reality before us is of a diseased Christianity of both the left and right that must be countered by rediscovering radical allegiance to Christ, recognizing the reality of the battle we are in and reclaiming core Christian orthodoxy, end quote. It's a battle. 
Those are very strong words by a man who had spent so many years doing ministry within the United Methodist Church. A fellow clergy member. Was he right? Are ministers complicit for intentionally not preaching Romans 1? Are Christian churches saturated with theological falsehoods and moral indifference? By embracing homosexuality, have churches lost the embrace of Christ? Now, just while, while he was talking there, I missed a little bit of that. I was looking something up. 1976. 1976. Harold Linsell. Harold Linsell in 1976 testified the following. Are you ready? I quote, it is not unfair to allege that among denominations like Episcopal, United Methodists, United Presbyterian, United Church of Christ, the Lutheran Church in America, and the Presbyterian Church USA, there is not a single theological seminary that takes a stand in favor of biblical infallibility. Harold Linsell, Battle for the Bible, Zondervan, 1976, page 145. So in 1976, it was already being saying, hey, within the United Methodist Church, there's not a seminary that takes a stand in favor of biblical infallibility. Well, once you throw out biblical infallibility, once you throw out that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God, once you undermine the scriptures, then it's a free-for-all. So... United Methodist churches should have been leaving the denomination way before we get to 2022, 2021, 2020, 2023 over the issue of homosexuality. That's 1976. That's just one book. I, I, I've got an entire article here about basically um, th this entire article and its pages. The Modernistic Attack on the Bible in These Last Days, which was published in 2009. And it goes through the entire history of modernism and modernism and how it began to attack the Bible. And we could go back, we can all, I mean, we could go through a, a long history of these issues. But you can go back and see the undermining of, of, of biblical theology and biblical doctrine by the United Methodists. Why did the churches not leave then? I mean, again, now you can say, well, I know a good United Methodist Church, but if the denomination is corrupt, leave the denomination. All right, but that's okay. So I just want to make sure you realize once again, we can make the focus becomes homosexuality when I always believe the issues are deeper than that. But let's continue. And perhaps the big question I challenge each of you to ask yourselves this morning is this. Is American Christianity diseased with a false and unorthodox gospel? Wow. Okay. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this really quick. That is a, a very awesome, um, awesome question. So I'm going to do this. <sighs> Now, yes, having a little fun, but that's an amazing question. Is American Christianity diseased, infected with basically a, a false gospel? Now, I don't know which direction he's going to go here. I believe, yes, American Christianity is massively infected with a false gospel. It's a gospel that undermines. Now, he may look at the gospel of these liberal churches, but I don't look at the gospel of the liberal churches. They've already abandoned Christianity. I'm looking at the gospel in conservative churches who I believe they are infected and diseased with a false gospel, a, a gospel that undermines, listen, the doctrine of justification as outlined, I believe, in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Historical, reformed, and I say reformed meaning coming from the Protestant Reformation, Protestant understanding of justification because the liberal churches abandoned Christianity, conservative churches wanting to fight the cultural wars and fighting the liberalism and the prevalence of sin 
in many cases, almost turns to a works-based gospel in order to fight and condemn it. And you don't fight the prevalence of sin and ungodliness with a works-based system. You don't fight it with law. You fight it by calling people to faith in Jesus Christ, to salvation, by grace alone, through faith alone, where we are declared to be something we're not because of an imputed righteousness, because we do not get an infused righteousness. But let's see which direction, how he's going to say the gospel or the church, the American Christianity has been basically poisoned or diseased. Let's, let's see how he describes it. I start with that question because today's scripture passage starts with verse 16 in which Paul unabashedly declares that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, right? Because the gospel is God justifies a sinner. God does it all. It's the power of God. He takes a sinner who deserves nothing. He he it's through God. God has to grant the faith. God brings us to salvation and then declares us to be something we are not. That's all the power of God. Now, is he going to understand that power in a different way? Is he going to, is he going to describe the power more in an infused righteousness way or understand that power in an imputed righteousness way? Because in an imputed righteousness way, I'm, I'm basic, I'm, I'm made completely perfect and holy in Christ, even though I am not. And then in verse 17, Paul goes right in to say that the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. And consequently, in verse 18, the wrath of God is awaiting all those who continue to live in unrighteousness, a life that is contrary to the gospel. Now, yes, we can have a long discussion about what we mean um, in verse a 17 for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith the righteousness of God we be, it is revealed it is it becomes to us it's given to us by faith by faith i am declared to be righteous remember that was luther's whole issue luther's like i've tried everything i've tried you know punishing myself going to confession luther was overwhelmed with the fact that god is holy and he, no matter what he did he could never be holy never and then he realized the righteousness of god is made made Present, it, it, it's manifest through faith. In other words, by faith, I'm declared to be, I am given a righteousness that is not mine in practice. That was the whole Protestant Reformation. So we must pause here and ask ourselves a very important question. Just what exactly is the gospel? Whenever I take this pulpit, I try to preach it because I don't know who's in attendance. The gospel is very simple. It can be summarized in four points, if not even less. First, there is a God who is holy, just, and love. He created this universe out of nothing. And as Paul will go on later in this chapter, he left evidence of his existence throughout through the creation he so wonderfully made. Okay, he's defining the gospel. Point number one, there is a God who is holy, who is righteous, who is creator, and has revealed himself in his creation to some level. Okay, all right. Awesome. I love when there's agreement. I love when there's agreement. All right. All right, now he said four points. I'm getting nervous, but we'll see where he's going to go here. All right, I got no problem saying four points, but I'm, I'm just... Oh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I hope, I hope there's complete agreement here. I hope, but well, actually in some ways, I hope there is an agreement. Not so, because I'm not here to criticize, but then I can contrast his approach versus my approach. And then you, the listener gets two different approaches. And then you can kind of figure out which way you want to go. I, I, look, I, you know, I, I know this within Christianity, nobody agrees on anything. So you disagree with me, that's fine. My job is to try to get you to think, to challenge us the whole point and, and try to challenge you from a theological perspective that maybe, maybe you're not familiar with. And right now, all I'm trying to do is defend as closely as I can, as carefully as I can, that historical doctrine of justification 
by an imputed righteousness, not an infused righteousness. I am trying my best to get people to, that's where I feel we're losing the gospel. But let's see, right? So far, no problem. There is God. He is absolutely holy and he is creator and he, he's, he's revealed to some level within the creation. Okay, so far, we're good. What do you think the next three points are? Right. If I was in, if I was in a, a preaching class or a hermeneutics class or any kind of class, I would ha- I would stop the sermon right now and have students grab a piece of paper and say, "Okay, guys, here we go. What are the next three points? Go." It would be interesting to see if everyone came close to the to the three points or had completely like different ones. I I have an idea. I have an idea. I, I think we may get into a. a well, I'm not going to say. Well, here we go. Here we go. Point number two, all humans are sinners deserving of eternal hell. We are all guilty sinners before God, and so we deserve hell upon our deaths. And that's bad news. Oh, wow. Now, I love that. There is a God, and we are all sinners. Now, remember, we are all sinners first in Adam. We're already guilty in Adam. We're, we are sinners by nature. And because we are sinners by nature, therefore, we sin in action. All right, we're sinners in Adam, we're guilty in Adam, we're sinners in nature, and we're sinners in action. The action flows from the nature, it flows from what we are. Again, we do not become sinners by sinning, but we sin because we are sinners. What we are leads to what we do, our sinful thoughts, and guess what? That sinful nature remain. So, so far we're good. I, I may, I may have described us being a sinner and I'm, I love going to the, the nature part and guilty and Adam part and that we do sinful actions because of what we are. I love to stress that maybe more than other preachers, but okay. All right. So far, so good. That means we've only got two points left. We've only got two points left. Oh boy. What are they, what are they going to be? Let's, let's listen. But point number three, the good news is this. God so loved the world, he gave his only son Jesus, who was fully God and fully man. He lived a sinless life and he died on the cross to pay for the sins of all who would believe in him. Resurrecting on the third day, it's not a myth, it historically occurred. So that point number four, if you personally repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord God and Savior, you shall have eternal life. You shall be saved. That's the gospel, but you must personally do it. Okay. All right. I I got no problem with this. There is a God. We are sinners. God, to, to, to take care of the sin problem, sent his son to die and pay for our sins. And we must repent and believe. Now, the issue may be the repentance part, right? Because this is where there becomes major division within Christianity. Some people see repentance as a change of direction or action, and other people define repentance as a change of mind. It's changing my mind. Now, we should all be, we should all agree that a change of mind is involved, right? Because, hey, I'm a sinner. Someone presents the gospel to me and I change my mind. You're right. I am a sinner. You're right. That is a sin. Yes, I do believe that Jesus died for me. You're changing your mind about all of this. Now, you would hope that change of mind would always lead to a change of action, but the change of mind doesn't always lead to a change of action because you still have a sinful nature. All right. But some will be like, no, 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 no. The repentance will be a direct change of action. I believe if you look up the meaning of the word repentance, and we've done this multiple times, the basic simple meaning is a change of mind. Now, I hope that the change of mind should have some impact on us because you've changed your mind. I do believe it should change. But remember, we have something fighting that change of mind which is the sinful nature, which is not eradicated in salvation. And not only that, we're not infused with righteousness. We only get an imputed righteousness, or I should say not get. An imputed righteousness is accredited to my account. So therefore, I, when I'm justified, yeah, I, I've changed my mind. And I'm accepting that Jesus is, is the eternal son of God. He died for me. He paid for my sins. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, that I deserve death. That's a change of mind. So I do believe a change of mind is involved. I just don't turn it into a complete change of action because then it would be like, well, wait a minute. 
how much change of action is required in order. If repentance is a requirement for salvation, then would I not have to change the action prior to being saved? And what we typically do is like, no, 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 no. You don't have to change the action in order to be saved. You have to be willing to change the action in order to be saved. But if you don't change the action enough, then you were never saved. Meaning the change of action is required for salvation, which becomes a major problem. And you once again, destroy the doctrine of justification. I, I'm, I'm, we'll see how, because I, I bet you he's getting ready to focus on the repentance part. I could be wrong, but I bet you he's getting ready to focus on the repentance part and he's going to directly connect the repentance part to one sin in particular. And I bet you it's the sin of homosexuality, but I could be wrong. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm wrong because that's, then we would have, there would be a difference of opinion, but on the other way, I, I hope he does do that because then you can hear two different perspectives. So it, whichever way it goes, it should be a win-win for everyone. All right, here we go. Being in church or being part of a family of believers does not make you a Christian. It must be a personal decision for Jesus Christ. But the moment you hear that gospel and believe in that gospel, theologians call that regeneration. You are born again. You are justified at that moment in the presence of God. If you were to die a moment afterwards, you would, your, your eternity would be sealed in heaven with God. All right, now, I, I agree. At that very moment, you are saved. And if you were to die at that very moment, at that very moment, you would go to heaven. I will argue if you were to die 10 days later, you would go to heaven. Even if for those 10 days, you're engaging in gross, horrible, ungodly sin. Because your salvation is not based on what you do and don't do. It's based on the fact that you now are justified by God. Even if for the next 10 days, you left the church where you just made a profession of faith and were just saved and justified by faith alone, and you went home to your lover of the same sex and continued to engage in relations with that lover for the next 10 days, would you still not be saved? Because all those sins have been paid for, and you're justified by the imputed righteousness of Christ. Now, some will say, absolutely not. But how many people walk out of that church heterosexual, and engage in sin for those next 10 days. Even if it's not, even if it's not a sexual sin, they're still going to sin. I mean, I don't know about you. When I left First Baptist Church in Tuscola, Texas, the night of my salvation. Now that night I didn't, I went home and read my Bible, but uh, trust me, over the next 10 days, there was still plenty of sin going on in my life. And guess what? All of those years later in 2023, there's still sin in my life. And I start with that question. I start with the question of the gospel. Because some of you here today might have been saved as children by simply believing in that gospel that I declared. But it segues to today's chapter because it brings to, for, to, our, to our attentions this morning a very important question. The forefront here is the second question, is, a, is it possible? Is it possible for a person to be gay and be a Christian? Here we go. Is it possible for a person to be gay and a Christian? I would rephrase the question. Is it possible for a person to be a sinner and be a Christian. And it's a clear affirmative that you can be a sinner and be a Christian because we are all sinners. So if I can be a sinner and a Christian, then why can't I be gay and a Christian? Not justifying the sin, not justifying homosexuality. The issue is, can I still be a sinner 
and be saved? Can I be a fornicator and be saved? Can I have lust, which then makes me guilty of adultery? Can I be a backbiter, slander, not submissive to authority, a, 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 a woman not being submissive to her husband, a, a, child, a, a teenager not being uh, honoring their parent or being obedient to over and over? You can be those things and still be saved because salvation is based off an imputed righteousness, not a practical righteousness. And no matter how good you say, well, well, I can still be a sinner, but I'll sin less. But you're still a sinner. Okay. No matter how much you stop sinning, you will still be a sinning and a sinner. And I can make it very clear. Here's the, you know what I'm going to say. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. You're never going to pull that off. So you're going to be a violation of that scripture your entire Christian life. Love your neighbor as yourself. You're never going to pull that off and be holy as God is holy. I'm sorry. You're in a perpetual state of sin. So if you can't be a homosexual and be saved, well, then I don't think you can be anything and be saved because we're all sinners continually and still are supposedly saved. Is my salvation based off what I do or what Christ did? Now, what should someone do who's in those sins? We should all do what we try to do. We try to die to self. We try to put off the old man. We try to put on the new and we battle and we fight and we struggle and we confess and we work and we pray and we look to scripture and we do our best to try to move towards godliness and, and in fact, fight against it, struggle against it, acknowledge the sin, acknowledge the struggle, acknowledge what's going. That's the reality of the Christian life. It's one of battle and struggle and and failure and sin. At the same time, I am declared to be something that I am not perfect, holy, and righteous. Is that possible? So the first question was, what's the gospel? The second question is, is it possible for a person to be gay and a Christian? According to the Bible this morning, the answer is no. A person must repent, turn from, and forsake his or her homosexual past in order to be a faithful follower of Christ. <sighs> okay. Then guess what? Can you be a sinner and be saved? The answer is no, because you must repent and turn from all of your sin. You must repent and turn from your lust. You must repent and turn from your fornication. You must repent and turn from not being submissive to it. You must repent and turn from, and if you don't, you're not saved. Now, He's obviously putting repentance in the terms of actual change. Now, I would say you would have to change your mind about homosexuality. You would have to change your mind about it, right? You would have to say, no, I, I now acknowledge it's a sin. I now know that I must struggle against it, right? It's just like, a, 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 say, a teenager, a young adult who becomes saved. Okay. Oh, no. Well, now, now I know I can't, I can't go. I can't be sleeping with my girlfriend. I know it's a sin. I know it's wrong. I'm acknowledging it's wrong. You think it immediately stops? I mean, I, what, what kind of foolishness do you think that's the case? Find how many, talk to a lot of teenagers who grew up in the church, right? Grew up in the church, who, who are Christians and find out the things they were doing as a teenager, as a professing believer. See, I mean, the issue, I, I, everyone wants to make the issue homosexuality. The issue is, can you be a sinner and be a Christian? And the answer has to be in the affirmative because we're all sinners. But then we come to the sin of homosexuality. Like, nope, you can't be a Christian and gay because you have to repent of your gayness. You have to just change your, your sexual orientation. Now, I've said this before, repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You cannot faithfully follow Christ unless you first repent or turn from your sin. You either have one or the other. Now, once again, I want to make this very clear. If you define repentance as more than just a change of mind, but a change of action, I, I, I don't care the game you try to play. This is what you're saying. Hey, you would like to become a Christian? All right, you have to repent of your sin. Well, what does that mean? You got to change up from all your, you got to turn from all your sin. 
What sin? All, every sin. You got to turn from all sin. So you can't sin anymore. You got to turn from it all because you can't be a sinner and be a Christian. So you, so you got to list, tell me your sins. You're going to turn from that. You're going to turn from that. You're going to turn from that. You're going to turn. Are you going to stop doing that? Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Now, I got no problem saying you got to change your mind about those sins. I got no problem saying you can't be a faithful follower of Christ and do these things. That's why we're all unfaithful to some level, but God remains faithful even when we are unfaithful, praise God, because my salvation is based on what he did. But you would literally have to preach salvation like, okay, you want to be a Christian? Great. You've got to repent from every sin, every sin. What does that mean? You got to stop doing it. Now we'll say, well, no, 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 no. You just got to be willing to turn from it. But if you're willing to turn from it, but don't turn from it, then you didn't turn from it. So if, if you, if, if gayness is the thing you have to turn from, then you've got to put everything else in the same category. You must turn from every single sin. You must walk away from here and never commit another sin. Now I would think what you would say is you must now change your mind about sin. You must now acknowledge that is contradictory to the lifestyle God calls me to live. I'm just saying the same standard you're going to put on gay people has to be put on uh, on on uh, quote unquote straight straight people or are homosexuals versus heterosexuals. And while we are saved by faith, by simply believing in the gospel, authentic saving faith is manifested by forsaking the sin of homosexuality. Here we go. Authentic faith. Now, now the thing is, is by faith, I'm declared perfectly righteous and imputed righteousness. But now authentic faith will manifest itself by what I do. Well, wait a minute. Faith is how I receive imputed righteousness and I'm saved apart from what I do. But no, 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 no. If that faith is true, so imputed righteousness has to manifest itself in practical righteousness. Well, once again, well, then why don't I make that demand on everyone? Genuine faith will manifest itself by you forsaking all sin. Why are we just focusing on homosexuality? Because there's a lot of sins mentioned in this chapter, is there not? There is covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters. There's all of these other disobedient to parents. Yeah, okay, someone just said, didn't he say we were justified the instance we believe? Yes, he did. So do you lose it if you don't change your actions or was the belief just not real? You don't lose it because he, because he, he says, you know, he'll, he would say you never got it. So you believed, but you didn't really get it because you have to repent of it. So it would almost be better to believe and then die instantaneously because anyone who walks out of the room and five seconds later, you're going to prove that you didn't really mean it because I guarantee you, you're still going to sin. And why is homosexuality the only sin being mentioned here when there's all those other sins mentioned in Romans 1? Well, let's just go through the rest of the New Testament and find all the list of sins. Lust. Pride, anger. I mean, we can go on or, 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 or the wrong kind of anger. There's a right kind of anger. You get it. We can just go sin after sin after sin after sin. If you, if you demand that so you cannot be fa saved, if you don't repent of that sin, then you would have to demand that you're not saved unless you repent of all sin. And we all know that we say we repent of all sin, yet we continue to sin. You must repent that you don't love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And you never will love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. You have to repent that God demands you to be holy as he is holy. You're never going to be as holy as God is holy. So therefore, you're always in a perpetual state of sin. Therefore, I guess your repentance wasn't genuine. Therefore, I guess you're not saved. But no, we're just going to make it about homosexuality, I guess. According to verse 7, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, and as a result, the true believer now seeks to live a life of faithful righteousness. Hence, righteousness and true belief go hand in hand. 
Okay, so he's taking that righteousness as a practical righteousness, not an imputed righteousness. Oh, man. Okay, hang on. Um, Hang on, give me one second. I know we're wait, go I know this is long, but that's okay. At this point. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, Luther finally understood that man holds no righteousness of his own. He has none which which is supported by the remi- remainder of Romans chapter 1. Any righteousness he may receive can only come from God, but God does not, but God does indeed reveal and even grant righteousness to his creation. All right. Hang on. Um, uh, he says here in it, in Romans 1 17, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. A verse taken from the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. As Luther, as Luther would stop short and say, what does this mean? What, that there's this righteousness that is by faith and from faith to faith. What does it mean that the righteousness shall live by faith? Which again, I said was the thematic verse of the whole exposition of the gospel. Uh, that Paul set forth here in Romans. And so the light came on for Luther and he began to understand that what God was speaking of here was a righteousness that God in his grace was making available to those who would receive it passively, not those who would achieve it actively, but that would receive it by faith and which a person could be reconciled to a holy and righteous God. It is a imputed righteousness. He just turned it into a practical righteousness. That man is justified by a practical righteousness. Now, I know that's not what he's intending to do, but that's what he's doing. He's saying that faith produces a practical righteousness. And I'm saying faith makes us, uh, faith is how we are given or how a righteousness is imputed to our account. All right, we're at 81 minutes. Let's see if we can wrap this up. So the term gay Christian is a misnomer. So therefore the term sinful Christian is a misnomer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I've got some bad news for you. You're not saved because you still sin. A contradiction of terms. In God's view, there is only a Christian or a non-Christian. There is no such thing as a gay Christian, just as there is no such thing as an adulterer Christian or a murderer Christian. Yes, you may have committed those sins in the past, prior to coming to Christ, but no more. Wow. Hey, you no longer commit those things when you become a Christian. No more. Christians don't commit fornication. Christians don't commit adultery. But wait a minute. If I look at a woman with lust, I've already committed adultery in my heart. I guess all Christian men no longer do that. Just a little bit more about Luther and Romans 117. All right. This is important. And so Luther said, and I quote, whoa, you mean the righteousness by which I will be saved is not mine? It is what he called an alien righteousness, a righteousness that belongs properly to somebody else. It's a righteousness that is outside of us, namely the righteousness of Christ. As Luther said, when I discovered that I was born again of the Holy Ghost and the doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. In other words, uh, Luther understood, no, 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 the righteousness that comes by faith is an alien righteousness that is imputed to me, not infused in me. And now he's, this is just said, no, 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 no. Faith produces a practical, or that faith, the genuine faith is manifested in a practical righteousness. He's not even mentioned imputed righteousness once. And now he's basically said, hey, when you become a Christian, you'll no longer do these things. So when you become a Christian, you, you can't just say those things. You can't do any. You can't do any. You can't be proud, prideful. 
And so you become a Christian, you'll never be prideful again. That's, you know that's not true. You're never going to lust again. You know that's not true. You have been washed, you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and so now you strive to live a life of righteousness. See that, see, see that all of a sudden the switch? You'll try. No, 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 no. There's no trying. You just said, I will not do those things. It's not trying because if trying is good enough for the heterosexual, trying is good enough for the homosexual. This then brings me to a third question. The third important question could then be, but pastor, what if I was born gay? Is it still a sin? Because as long as I could remember, I, 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 pastor, I feel as if I was born gay. What, what if that's the case? Uh, for the record, as of now, there is been no medical discovery of a gay gene. What science has proved, however, because I believe in science, what science has proved is that persons are either born with XX or XY chromosomes. And, that, and thus, they are hardwired, each one of us are hardwired to be either male or female by God. This is precisely why, until May of 1992, the World Health Organization had homosexuality listed as a mental disorder. My friends, what has changed? Did the biology change? Did the science change? No. Okay, Christians making the the never-ending argument over whether someone was born gay or not born gay. Let's start here. Number one, nobody, I don't think anyone, has a clear clue or understanding of why some people have certain sexual desires versus other sexual desires, why some people like certain things and don't like certain things. Sexual preference and desire is a complicated thing that nobody truly understands. But I know this, we are all born sinners, and if they are, if someone is born a sinner and that sin manifests itself in having same sex attraction, just as I'm born a sinner and I have opposite sex attraction that sometimes manifest as lust, this guess what? We are both born sinners. The issue isn't whether you're born that way or not born that way because you're born a sinner. Therefore, we're all condemned. The issue is that our only hope is in Jesus Christ and an imputed righteousness. And then we seek to live out what God calls us to do, but it's going to be imperfect. It's going to be messy and it's going to be filled with sin. Your life is going to be, whether you're a homosexual or whether you're heterosexual, it's going to be filled with sin. Now, yes, the homosexual coming to Christianity would have to understand something, that the Bible does condemn the action, therefore they cannot engage in the action. Just like someone who is single, who becomes a Christian, has to understand that the Bible condemns sexual uh, sexual relation outside of marriage. So, in other words, you just have to understand, no, I cannot pursue that as a Christian because God condemns it. I may fall into it. I may desire it. I may want, just, again, does lust go away because you become a Christian? No, it doesn't go away. You fight it. You struggle with it. You you have to constantly battle it. So why would you then immediately assume if someone who is who has desires for same sex they have same sex attraction? Why would that would just magically go away when you get saved? It doesn't magically go away in the heterosexual. It doesn't magical magically go away in the homosexual. And forget sexuality. There's a million other sins and wrong desires and things and feelings and attitudes and actions and motivations that are wrong that still remain inside of us, even after conversion, because in conversion, we're not infused with righteousness. We are declared to be righteous. The politics changed. But suppose one day, suppose one day, let's imagine that scientists discover some sort of 
genetic difference that, that sways certain individuals to be gay. Maybe hormonal, maybe some sort of genetic difference. Would that then make it no longer a sin? And the answer is absolutely not. Take alcoholism, for example. As of now, an actual gene that causes alcoholism has still yet to be identified. But according to some, there is a growing body of scientific evidence that alcoholism has a genetic component. Suppose one day we discover that alcoholism does indeed have a genetic component. It hasn't been discovered yet, but let's say it does. Does it now make it right? Should alcoholism then be embraced and celebrated? Does it cease from being sin in the eyes of God? Of course not. Listen, the fact is we live in a fallen world, and this is the theological answer. The theological basis for all of this is the following. We live in a fallen world, and since the first humans, Adam and Eve, sinned against God, sin now impacts everything we do. In fact, Scripture informs us that we are all born sinners and we inherit a sinful nature from Adam and Eve. Theologians call this original sin. But irrespective of what you call it, it explains why so many of us have a hard time doing what we know is right. Wait. Are you saying Christians still have a hard time doing what is right? I thought we repented of that and we no longer do that. So do we no longer do it or do we still struggle with doing it? I, I don't, I don't, I'm, 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 I'm now trying to figure this out. Sin feels very natural to all of us, but it doesn't make it right. Our sinful desires and natures cause all of us to intensely crave sin. Wait, even believers intense and intensely crave sin, just like a homosexual may intensely crave a same sex relationship. So the heterosexual can intensely crave sin, but the homosexual can't. I thought, I thought we no longer do these things. I, I thought we stopped doing these things. But the answer is not abdication to the impulse, but rather we, we defeat the power of sin through the power of the gospel. See, and then he, now he's turning the power of the gospel is how we defeat sin. But the power of the gospel is how we're saved from sin by declaring me to be righteous, even though I am not. By accounting to me righteousness, that is not mine. That is foreign. That is alien. Again, this is just basic Reformation theology coming from Luther himself from the Protestant Reformation. But we always turn the power of the gospel as as, as basically an infused righteousness that now I can combat the sin. I'm still a sinner. That nature is going to be there. It doesn't excuse anything. Listen, friends, you still might feel the attraction, but the good news is that as a Christian, you now have the power to fight it and not succumb to it. Hallelujah. Okay, so, so you can still have the attraction. But you, you now have the power to fight it and not succumb to it. So then, let's just logically pr proceed. All Christians, you now have the power to never sin again. If they have the power to never commit that sin, you now have the power to... So every Christian now has the power to be perfect. So there is no more excuse for your sin. None. Zero. So God did not come to declare us righteous by an imputed righteousness, uh... Yeah, okay, someone just said, so confusing when pastors do this. Oh, absolutely, it's confusing when pastors do this. It's maddening. You're like, I don't know which direction to go. So on one hand, hey, no, 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 no. You've been saved. You've repented from it. You don't do those things again. Well, now, well, no, you still desire. But no, 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 no. You may desire, but you have the power to stop doing it. Well, if I have the power to stop doing it, 
Forget homosexuals. Just forget homosexuals now. Forget it. Every single person, you now have the power to never sin again. So in this church, here are the rules. You don't sin, period. Because if you do, it's because you want to do it because you have the power not to do it. So in this church, we expect perfection because we all have the power to never sin again. Well, you make that your church's standard. Start with the pastor. If you're a heterosexual, your desire for your neighbor's wife could be indeed very natural. It might even feel as if you were born with such desires. It does not make it right. I completely agree. It doesn't make it right. I completely agree. Just like every, every, because everyone has a sinful nature. Nobody is saying it makes it right. What we're saying is we got to defend the doctrine of justification. And what you've turned it into is that the gospel, it, the gospel is about making us better practically, not declaring us perfectly positionally. And then you're claiming that we can basically be perfect practically. And then you back up and say, well, I mean, it's just going to be natural to desire your neighbor's wife. It's just the natural, but you have, but, I, but we have the power to, to fight it. But even if we have the power to fight not doing it, the fact that I desire it makes me already guilty of it, right? If I desire my neighbor's wife, am I not guilty of adultery according to scripture? So you would have to say, not only do I have the power not to do it, I have the power not to even desire it. Therefore, you're calling for sinless perfection. So the question of whether or not there's a genetic component to it is a moot point. Complete agree. It it doesn't matter if there's a genetic component. I completely, we are in complete agreement there. That which scripture calls sin is sin and must be fought instead of being abdicated to. And the good news this morning is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the power of the gospel, you can overcome those desires. Amen? Okay, then you can stop sinning. Now, the point is, he says, overcome the desire. But if you have the desire... Aren't you already guilty? See, th- this this is almost re- reducing Christianity to an, an external moral system. Hey, as long as you don't, look, you now have the power not to do any of this externally. But Jesus came along and said, no, you got to do it right internally. Now let's read verse 26. Now, I will stop right there. You should go look up the sermon, Do Gay Christians Exist? by Stephen Kim. It's the featured sermon on Sermon Audio today. Uh, You can go listen to the rest of it. Uh, I'll stop there, one, because I want him to get the downloads and the streams that he deserves. So please go listen to it. Um, And two, again, it's not even really about him. It's not even really about his position. I wanted you to hear his position versus my position. We have two different approach. We are in agreement on so much. And then we, then everything just goes off, off the road, off the road. Here's the thing. We are saved by an imputed righteousness. That righteousness declares me to be perfect, holy, and obedient because of what Christ did, not by what I do. That does not infuse any righteousness in me. It declares me to be righteous. In position, I'm wholly perfect. In my position, I'm a new creature in Christ. All things, all things have become new. The old is completely gone away. In my position and practice, I'm not a new creature because the old nature is still there and I still sin. I sin in thought. I sin in word. I sin in desire. I sin in feeling and I sin in action. I am in a perpetual state of sin of some way, shape or form because God's standards are perfect. God's law demands a perfect righteousness, which I will never fulfill. So I can say I repent of it all day, but I'm still going to sin. The best I can do is change my mind, acknowledge it's a sin, struggle and fight with it. Don't, don't, 
make excuses for it. Don't don't uh, say that it's okay. You condemn it. You fight it. You struggle with it. You confess and you move forward in this Christian life, knowing it's going to be a battle of ups and downs, failure and confession, but knowing that in Christ, I am perfect, no matter how imperfect I am positional, uh, practically, and that one day there'll be no more sin and I'll be perfect and holy, not just in position, but practically when I am glorified. I focus on imputed righteousness. I focus on a righteousness by faith, which is the imputed righteousness. He argues the righteousness by faith is the righteousness that is manifested because I believe now practical righteousness is manifested. And then he's judging the imputed righteousness on the basis of practical righteousness that supposedly is manifest in my life. I will tell you, if you judge your faith based off practical righteousness manifested in your life, all I have to do is take the law of God and say, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved, because because God's law demands absolute perfection, which you will never be, whether you're heterosexual, whether you're homosexual, whether you're straight, whether you're gay, whether you're bisexual, whether you're transgender, everyone is going to be guilty under the law of God. Nobody's sin is excused, but that reality needs to be acknowledged. Again, go listen to the sermon, Do Gay Christians Exist? by Dr. Stephen Kim. Uh, So much there that I agree with. Slight differences here or there. Some big differences on where I put my emphasis. But you got to hear two different perspectives. And by all means, you go with the one you want. Because that's what Christianity is all about anyway, right? Because that's exactly how it works. I'm not here so much to criticize or critique it. I'm here more to just say, hey, here's someone who presents a very articulate, he defends, he tries to defend his position. Here's my position. Now you today, you struggle with these theological implications and see where you end up. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. I'm going to go eat lunch. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.